Hello, welcome to the House of Wellness. I'm Luke Darcy. And I'm Jo Stanley and I'm thrilled as always to be here with you, Darce. And can I say how much I'm loving the change of season and all the brilliant autumn colours out at the moment. It's so beautiful. Oh, it's a brilliant time of the year, Jo, yeah. no doubt about that. But the colder nights also make me think of those doing it a bit tough, living without a roof over their heads. Yeah, more than 116,000 people don't have adequate shelter on any given night. They're forced to couch surf, stay in hostels, sleep in their car or even on the streets. Yeah, it's incredibly sad and they say that for every person experiencing homelessness, you can see there are 13 more that you can't, which is a shocking statistic, Joe. And that's why the work of the Salvation Army and its annual Red Shield appeal is so important. Their aim? To leave no one in need. I think when you actually take the time to sit down and listen to a person's story, when I do that, I actually move very quickly from a position of judgment to a position sometimes of awe, <laughs> you know, where I think to myself, I, I can't believe you're still going. I, after all you've been through and everything that life has thrown at you, I can't believe that you're still up and about and going. And I feel in those situations that I could do nothing less than throw every possible ounce of support I can find at that person to help them get back on their feet and get going again. They are the silent army and they've always been there. They're at every disaster zone, they patrol the streets and offer an ear and a hand up to those who need it most. They're a human being and the reality is when you hear their story, they're somebody's son or daughter or somebody's mum or dad or grandma or grandpa. We've never needed the Salvos more than now. It started with the bushfires in 2020, catastrophic floods and a global pandemic. The Salvation Army had to pivot, but pivot really, really quickly. And we had people coming into a place like this and uh, we've got centres like this all over the country where people would come for a meal and people would come inside. It was much more than a meal, it's about community. And I think COVID actually indicated to us really powerfully how important community is. There's consistently 300,000 Australians that reach out to the Salvation Army every year uh, and they're people that are in often really incredibly vulnerable situations. So they could be people that are homeless, they could be people that are suffering from addiction, they could be people that are escaping family violence and they've got nowhere else to turn. So tell us about Project 614. So we're based in the city of Melbourne and we've been operating for about 19 years now as Project 614 and I, I think uh, one of the things that we're really passionate about here is obviously meeting the practical needs of people that get involved, but it's also about building a really strong sense of community, strong sense of connection, a strong sense of acceptance of people that feel like they've been given up on by the rest of society. And we actually have people come here and they describe themselves as human rubbish or human refuse. Uh, because sometimes that's how they're treated. And they come here and we want to break that down very quickly and ensure that all of those people feel a really strong sense of welcome and acceptance. Everyone's familiar with the Red Shield Appeal. Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, the, the Salvation Army are really looking at the Red Shield Appeal from two positions. So one is we really need to raise $32 million and that just ensures that we continue to do the work that we're doing around the areas of homelessness Family violence is a critical one that we're involved in as well. And just meeting practical needs that Australians have on a regular basis. The other thing that we really desperately need this year is 30,000 volunteers uh, who will be people that are willing just to contact their friends and just say, will you chip in and help out the Salvos Red Shield Appeal this year? And did you find that because people were unsure and uncertain of their future during COVID, that that impacted how much people gave? Australians are just incredible. Like, they just... Uh, they, they were doing it tough, but they knew others were doing it even harder than they were. And Australians just dug deep and were absolutely incredible in the way that they looked out for each other. And uh, I really believe that, again, this year, Australians will dig deep once more and continue to care for their fellow Australians, which I just think is one of the most amazing qualities that we possess as Australians. What difference are they making by donating? 
What, what we do, to be honest, we run on the smell of an oily rag uh, with our services and um, the finite dollars that we receive, we absolutely stretch the limit to make sure that the people who are most vulnerable in our community receive the support that they desperately need. And so if you're able to pop in what you might regard as an insignificant figure for us, it will make a huge difference. So just $32 million does sound like a lot, but to be honest, it's just a drop in the ocean when it comes to meeting the mountain of needs that just keep coming day after day right across the nation. Which is why we need to get behind the Red Shield Appeal weekend on May 29 and 30. There'll be 30,000 volunteers everywhere collecting, so make sure you dig deep and give generously. And if you're not in a position to donate, how about offering your services as a volunteer? Check out salvationarmy.org.au to find out how you can help. Up next, a special insight into one of the most misunderstood anxiety disorders that's coming up on the House of Wellness. Welcome back. Well, one term that gets bandied about probably a little bit too much, Joe, maybe a little bit too lightheartedly, is obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD. Yeah, you often hear people use the throwaway line, I'm a bit OCD, meaning, you know, they're incredibly fussy or overly neat. But OCD is a far more complex disorder that affects around 2% of Australians. It's a fascinating subject, as award-winning filmmaker and journalist Santilla Chingayipe has discovered. Welcome, Santilla. Thanks for having me. It's lovely to have you on the show. <laughs> what did you know about OCD before you did this story and what drew you to it? I knew absolutely nothing um, apart from, as you mentioned, you know, you hear about it in popular culture. We don't actually know what it means. And to learn that it can be quite a debilitating um, illness for a lot of people was, I think, what really attracted me to finding out more about it. Now, your story, Santi, that we'll see in a couple of minutes focuses on two people with very different experiences of OCD. One we all recognise is actor Rick Davies, who most people know from Offspring, Joe, and Penny Moody. Now, can you give us a snapshot uh, of how their conditions differ? Yeah, so Rick, his OCD sort of manifests in ways that are quite familiar to a lot of people that have no or think about OCD. He's got the rituals aspect of um, the disorder. But with Penny, it's a little bit more complicated because hers is sort of more psychological and internalised. So you can't really see the manifestation of her OCD. And I thought that, that was quite fascinating when I got to meet both of them. Well, there's lots more to ask you, Santi, but first let's take a look at the story. When OCD is at that high level, it's like somebody being on a treadmill and not getting being able to get off it. Yeah, but it's, in, it's, it's so mentally um, fatiguing. It becomes all you think about. So when I was at my worst, it was the first thing I would think about when I woke up, and it was the last thing I'd think about when I went to bed. Um, OCD is a, a mental disorder which um, features both obsessions and compulsions. So obsessions are these scary, kind of distressing, um, unwanted thoughts, images or urges which cause this um, strong distress and which kind of pop into a person's mind and then are kind of difficult to kind of get rid of. And what about the compulsions? How do they manifest themselves? The, the compulsions will be um, these repetitive ritualistic behaviours. It's like um, cleaning or checking or seeking reassurance or tapping or doing a mental ritual. If people are, are doing those kinds of behaviours, they'll be doing them with a kind of a backdrop of feeling like look, I know that I shouldn't be engaging in this kind of behaviour, except that I feel like I have to. I'm feeling really anxious, even though logically I know that there's no danger here. And then actually... Penny Moody has days, lived with OCD for as long as she can remember. When I was really young, it sort of showed up in certain fears, so fears of my parents dying or fears of doing something wrong and then being taken away and maybe being arrested or things like that. So really kind of big fears for like such a little person and that's why I would then perform certain compulsions. So maybe saying certain things um, before I went to bed to try to make sure that they wouldn't die. Um, so then sort of turned into fears around um, getting sick or getting an illness, so I just convinced myself for so long that I had AIDS. When she hit high school, her fears morphed into anxieties around reputation and sexuality. Obsessions 
tend to be often kind of a bit taboo. Mm. So people will have um, obsessions about, am I bad? Am I irresponsible? Am I dangerous to other people? Am I a danger to myself? Am I in danger? Am I, yeah, am I, am I immoral? Um, am I gonna go crazy? And so these kinds of thoughts, there can be some shame attached to having thoughts like that. And so sometimes people aren't telling anybody else in their life about the kinds of thoughts that they're having, let alone talking to their GP about it. But it's so close to For Rick Davies, the condition appeared in repetitive and ritualistic so behaviours. So for a long time, if something happened or if I got an intrusive thought or if I was worried, I, I'd do this. It almost became like a bit, a bit of a, a tick, I suppose, or some a sort of reaction. I, I'd do this, mutter this little prayer that I managed to con condense into these little grunts and stuff. And this is before I was diagnosed and it was a way that I'd just fire off this little prayer like that. I used to put my fingers in my ears and close my eyes and really focus until I got it perfectly right, which is torture in itself because you can't get it perfect every time. And so you had to keep on going. And then, you know, you've, you've got no room left in your head when, when you actually get to a certain limit. Hello. While Rick's behaviours were visible, Penny struggled with a barrage of irrational thoughts. The, the rituals or the compulsions for me have generally been very internal. So it's been trying to think about, or sort of think my way out of the fears. But a lot of times for me, it was trying to sort of shut myself away, I guess, so that I could try and work out what was going on in my head or, you know, go on Google for hours and try to um, convince myself that um, I had nothing to worry about. Given the complexity of the condition, OCD can be difficult to identify. For Penny, it took courage and perseverance before finally being diagnosed at the age of 30. A lot of the thoughts that come up when you have OCD are really kind of fragile topics and it can be really hard to open up, you know, with someone that you don't know. Um, so a lot of the time people probably won't disclose what's really going on in their minds and so then it just sort of gets, gets diagnosed as anxiety. For Rick, a diagnosis when he was 18 years old was life-changing. It was incredibly liberating. Yeah, it was just like this moment where I was like, I'm not alone in this and there's stuff I can do. do. Like, I've been, in a way, I guess, fighting this unknown, you know, beast that I didn't know what it was. And now I was like, ah, there, you got a name and you got, I know what, what's your kryptonite and I'm gonna get you. OCD can't be cured, but it is treatable. The gold standard treatment is CBT, which is Cognitive Behavioural Therapy, with ERP, which is Exposure and Response Prevention. So effectively what we do with the treatment is um, expose people to their unwanted intrusive thought and then stop them from engaging in their compulsion. Initially it terrified me, um, but that's what we then did together and I think that was life changing for me. You know, I had one of my best mates years ago say, I don't know if you're the most relaxed, anxious person I know or the most anxious, relaxed person I know. And I, I think that sort of, you know, summarises at all for me that there has been times where I didn't have the skills to deal with it and I'd let it sort of rule me. And so training the OCD mind to live with uncertainty is, is I think one of the biggest wins you can have. And it's often a constant struggle, but it's, it's something that when you actually find that sort of new terrain in your mind, it makes life so much more enjoyable and easier. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow, what a very cruel condition. That description from Rick of, like, it being on a treadmill, it really brings it home, doesn't it? Mm. And for those of us who know so little about what it really means to be OCD, there is a tendency to trivialise it, isn't there? Yeah, and I, I have to admit, I was one of those people. I would say things like, I'm feeling a bit OCD. And when you spend time with people where this is very real, um, you start to wonder, gosh, we clearly don't talk enough about it and there, there needs to be greater awareness about it. But certainly it sort of shifted that even for me in terms of how I think about just how debilitating this is as a mental health disorder. As we saw, saying it's so consuming, so mentally debilitating, as you said, but it's invisible, which makes it all the more difficult for other people to understand. So 
How do you get around that? Yeah. So this is this is what was what I found to be quite fascinating, right? So for a lot of people, when we think about OCD, the ritual aspect is a big part of it. So, you know, people being quite pedantic and particular about certain things, but then you've got people that also uh, experience OCD through, um, you know, contamination. So they're germaphobes, for example, and they're neat freaks, and so sometimes they will their behaviour will show up in that way. But then you've got the complexity of the taboo part, which is these intrusive thoughts that can be quite violent or sexual in nature and other people that have sort of thoughts that are about over-responsibility, where you worry about hurting those around you. And Penny, for example, was someone that experienced the taboo part of that and the over-responsibility. So she um, would worry about uh, hurting people around her. That she. Um, shared a story about when she was a kid she thought that she had AIDS and she might give it to people even though she had no contact with anyone with AIDS. Um, and then with someone like Rick, he had the rituals, you know, because he would pray and he would sometimes put his ears over, his hands over his ears just to sort of quieten the, the noise in his head. But then he also had the taboo aspect of it where sometimes these intrusive thoughts, which in some way could be sexual in nature, would also sort of enter his, his brain. Um, and so you've got this really complicated way in which these things show up. And for someone like Penny, it was a little bit harder to diagnose because it wasn't showing up in the rituals that are very easy to identify. And that was what really stood out for me. They're so incredibly courageous in sharing their stories with you. I thought so too, because, you know, there's a lot of stigma around this. I mean, imagine talking to people about the fact that you've got these thoughts that are entering your brain that if you share them out loud, people might think there's something wrong with you, like, oh my God, like, why are you even thinking that? But to then sort of go, wow, a lot of people in this country are actually living with this, you know, and are terrified to talk about it. And so I think it was just really wonderful that they had the courage to speak up up about it in the hopes that it might help other people. Because in, in Penny's case, for example, she wasn't diagnosed for a long time. And part of the reason why she was misdiagnosed was because they couldn't identify the way in which OCD was showing up. And it wasn't until she read a magazine and she sort of went, gosh, that sounds like me. And then she went to a psychologist and went, look, I think I have OCD. And that was when she had the proper diagnosis. So there are a lot of people that might be having these sorts of thoughts and worrying about things, but not quite know exactly what it is. And so for them speaking out about it, I think it will help a lot of people. Sandy, I'm guilty too of that uh, expression, trivialising it at times mm. in, your, you know, in your own behaviour or someone close to you. Where is the point where it goes from being, you know, you like things neat and tidy or you have some of those aspects to actually full-blown OCD? Well, if I can think about it, I'm sort of trying to think of a useful analogy here. So think about the sort of rituals that we, 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 we conduct in our lives. So say, you know, I don't know if you're a bulldog supporter. Yes. You are, OK. <laughs> so say, <laughs> say, say <laughs> the bulldog... I'm very compulsive about it. <laughs> OK, yeah. great. So yeah. maybe you've got lucky socks that you put on when the bulldogs are I playing. I used to wear the same socks to the game. It was my superstition, my lucky socks. Right? So for someone like you, that is just a, a habit and a ritual. Yeah. But for someone that is living with OCD, them putting on those socks might be a way to sort of control the worries and fears that they might have about the action that they might then undertake that could end up causing harm, even though they won't end up doing it. So them putting on the socks might end up not just... It might not just be them putting on the socks, it might be checking on them every time, like lifting their shoe or something, yeah. just to ensure that they're feeling some level of control over something that's playing over and over in their heads. Whereas for you, you've kind of gone, this is something I do because, you know, my team might win, but then you'll forget about it, right? Mm. And I think that's sort of the different... This is where OCD becomes a little bit more different to just sort of wanting things done a particular yeah. way to when it's consuming. It can take up hours and hours and hours of your time in a day, which, 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 is, which is really exhausting. What's your takeaway before we let you go? I think that we need to be talking about OCD a lot more and, like, with every mental health disorder, I think um, the more people know that they're not alone, I think, would be incredibly helpful and to not make jokes about it, you know, yeah. that when we talk about it, OCD, this is something that does actually impact people and does have consequences and while some people might have rituals and they're pedantic about certain things, that is not the same thing as having a very serious mental health disorder. Sandy, it's been awesome to meet you. Thank you so much for opening up that discussion on a disorder that we don't know a lot about and like most conditions that can't be seen, it's one that deserves to be opened up about. Thanks again for joining us today. Thank you for having me.
Jules, you are a TV presenter, a stylist, social media influence, and most importantly, you're a mum. How do you fit it all in? <laughs> Excellent question, Zoe. <laughs> I don't know. I think at the end of the day, family comes first, and then I just prioritise that, and whatever comes after that, and however it all squishes into the day, is just how I figure it out. <laughs> it's just like, wake up and go, is my sounds, theory. <laughs> sounds pretty good, I love yeah. it. So obviously being a stylist, what's your, what's your style inspo? Oh, do you know what? Since becoming a mum, I think being comfortable is my number one, <laughs> yes. which can be quite boring, but it doesn't have to be. I think that's one thing I learned. You can still be very stylish and comfortable at the same time. So anything with stretchy pants, anything <laughs> oversized, anything that you can just throw on and move your entire body and get the job done, get the day done. Stick to your guns on your style. Don't try and be somebody else or try and wear what suits somebody else. Go with what you love and what, what makes you feel great. Because if you feel great going into your day, then you're, you're going to have a better day. Now, tell me a little bit about a fashion faux pas that's happened to you. Do you mean for me, <laughs> for styling? Absolutely. I've had some shockers, absolute shockers. Um, I think those very low jeans was a bit Ooh. of a thing for a minute there, where you bend over and everything kind of, mm. you can see everything. Um, that was a bad time. <laughs> um, the bell-bottom jeans, also quite a bad yes. time. But I feel like I, I was quite a tomboy growing mm. up, so I sort of stuck with tracksuit pants, like Adidas tracksuit pants and oversized Ralph Lauren jumpers, which were, <laughs> it just, it didn't work. And bad haircuts and the whole thing. So being that you are so busy, how has Nature's Way supported you through this process? I think top of mind always is family and under that comes health because I think health is wealth. And if you've got your health and well-being, I think you, you are up for a very rich life. Mm. And I think Nature's Way does that. It, you can have your vitamins in the cupboard, take it for yourself, give some to your husband, give some to your kids, and have that sort of knowledge that you're starting the day right. And then in amongst that comes your good diet, feeding your kids their, their fruit and veggies <laughs> as best as you can. <laughs> keeping them very active. We're a very active family, so we're always outside. Kids play a lot of sport. We're very active um, parents as well. So it's, it's a holistic sort of way to approach our lifestyle. Mm. When it comes to nature's way, which product would you say has worked best for you? I would say women's multivitamin for sure, because it's easy, it hits all the bases. It's a couple of vitamins and you're out the door, but also the hair, skin and nails is a really good one. I take that, keep it in my bathroom, draw upstairs, do that when I'm doing my hair and washing my face so that, so that it's all a part of the routine. <laughs> and I know I've done that for the morning. So those two uh, would be my, my top ones. Well, it's, it's working pretty well, darling. <laughs> you're fabulous, thank Aww. you very much. That's thank great. You. Now, here's a title we'd prefer not to have, Joan. That is, Australia has one of the highest rates of asthma in the world. It is shocking, isn't it? One in nine Aussies have the condition. But it's not just here. It also affects more than 339 million people worldwide. Now, as much as we think we know about asthma, there's a lot we don't, which is why we're lucky to have clinical nurse Narelle Williamson with us, who's not only had extensive experience in treating asthma, but also suffers from asthma Welcome, Narelle. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm sure many of the people you've treated must have felt quite a connection with you knowing that you have had first-hand experience yourself of asthma. Yes, I think it really makes a difference when you can understand exactly how someone's feeling when they're struggling for breath. I always liken asthma, for those who, who are lucky enough not to have asthma, to it like breathing through a thin straw. It's really difficult. Um, so I feel like I can relate to patients that little bit better. Um, knowing exactly what it feels like when you do have an exacerbation of asthma. And when were you diagnosed and how has it affected your life? I was diagnosed at around 14 or 15. Um, I played a lot of sport. I grew up in the country, so sport was the big thing in the country. Um, and so I was diagnosed with exercise-induced asthma. Um, and I've still got it today. Um, well controlled, as it should be, being a, you know, <laughs> someone who should know a lot about asthma. But um, it definitely used to affect my life before I learnt more about it. Um, I used to just take my reliever medication, which is commonly known as a puffer, and think that that would deal with the asthma and then, then that I would be good. But that's not the case and I learnt that throughout the years 
So what happens when someone suffers an asthma attack? What happens is that in our airways in our lungs, there is smooth muscle in the airways, in the walls of the airways, that contracts. And also there's inflammation inside the airways. So a lot of people think that it's just the contraction of the smooth muscle, and that's what our reliever puffers help with. But um, right inside the airways is inflammation. So just like if we cut ourselves and we see the red um, inflammation or scarring, that's what is actually happening in asthma inside our airways. I've heard people speak about an asthma plan. Can you explain what that is and how important it is to have one? A written asthma action plan guides patients when they're at home. Um, if people have an exacerbation of their asthma, it's a step-by-step -step plan. Um, if their symptoms are getting worse, we, it directs them in what medications to take, how to increase their medications, whether they need more doses in a day. Also includes emergency steps, such as when to call their doctor and when to call an ambulance. But we would hope no one ever gets to that point if they follow their plan correctly. So they're really important. The Global Initiative for Asthma did some research to find out what is the most common myth about asthma. Can you guess what it was? Do you know? Most common myth about asthma? Um... Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> it is that you need to have a wheeze to have asthma, which is actually not true, isn't no, that? So can that you is explain why that's a misconception? It's a misconception in that there's, um, there's four different main symptoms of asthma. It can be cough, chest tightness, shortness of breath or wheeze, and you don't necessarily have to have all four of those symptoms to be diagnosed with asthma. In fact, a lot of children have a wheeze due to bronchiolitis or just a viral infection, chest infection, but it's not actually asthma. Naru, what about really little kids? What should people be looking out for? Well, asthma is actually probably another myth, isn't diagnosed under two. Um, a lot, um, especially years ago, we used to diagnose asthma in children under two, but it's not asthma. It's actually um, a wheezy bronchiolitis. Um, so again, looking for those symptoms, it can be cough, um, shortness of breath with kids. They don't often explain chest tightness. They often get um, respiratory tract infections, which will start to show the symptoms of, you know, chest tightness, wheeze, um, shortness of breath. But yeah, if Children are um, all of a sudden getting very tired. That's another sign. So if they're normally able to run around the playground um, for a couple of hours a day and all of a sudden they can't do that, um, that's, that's a sign that there's something not quite right in their airways. And the Asthma Handbook has been updated, I believe, to bring in a new guideline in controlling asthma. Can you explain what that is? So, yes, a lot of Australians and people worldwide are overusing reliever medication. It's um, significant here in Australia because it's so cheap um, and it's available over the counter, so they don't need to, to go to the GP and get a script for it. Um, and in the new version, we're encouraging people to use a combination medication, which has reliever, but it also has preventer medication, which contains that corticosteroid that deals with inflammation. So with understanding how asthma affects you or someone you care about, then you can take control of your health. Narelle, thanks for coming in today and enlightening us on the thing you deal with every day, but also, as we found out, many, many Australians. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Huge welcome to the House of Wellness Kitchen. And if this happens to be your first time tuning in, this is where I love to whip up delicious recipes and with the help of my mate GQ, share why they're so good for you. And when it comes to overall health, Heinze, people like to know how to keep their immune system in check. You're totally right, mate. It is a fascinating operation in our body. Did you know our immune system keeps a record of every germ that has ever entered our body so that if it ever tries to come back again, it can defeat it? That's almost as efficient as you are in the kitchen, Heinze. And to help this germ-destroying process, look no further than vitamin C. I'm one step ahead of you, mate, because today I'm making my crowd favourite, sweet potato rosti, because sweet potato is loaded with the stuff. And it's so important to consume vitamin C every day because it's a water-soluble nutrient, so it's not stored in our body. Vitamin C is an antioxidant. It therefore destroys free radicals, which are responsible for cellular damage and illness. 
Sounds like a massive support for our immune system, not dissimilar to the support you give me here in the kitchen, GQ. I try very hard, Heinzy, but vitamin C is part of a team with things like beta carotene, vitamin E, and zinc. And these nutrients are all available in an effervescent, high dose powdered vitamin C supplement. I love this because not everyone likes taking tablets. It's as easy as mixing the orange flavoured supplement into water, juice, or smoothies. And you can't go wrong. <clears throat> Looks like you need a vitamin C hip, mate. How about that? <laughs> the A to Z of vitamins is brought to you by Bioceuticals Ultra Potent C, a delicious high-dose vitamin C powder to support your immune system to fight illness. These days, we're all after products that match our diet, our ethics and our skin type. Here's makeup artist Jade Kisnorbo and friends clearing up the questions around collagen. Collagen, <laughs> it's funny because I don't actually know too much. I know that it's something in your skin that plumps it. I know that it helps, with, helps me with my hair and my nails and my skin. Um, and that's, yeah, that's the main reason why I take it. I think that I've read somewhere or I've seen somewhere that it's like a protein. Um, and I think the only thing that I would probably be able to identify is that it's meant to be like good for skin health. Collagen has a really universal role in the body, um, in particular, obviously, our skin, and that's what I tend to focus on. It's one of the main proteins in the skin's formation, in the skin's function. So when you look at someone and you see their uh, skin texture, how well hydrated their skin is, it really, really comes back to collagen and it plays a big part. So we do produce collagen naturally and up until our late 20s, early 30s, kind of my age, <laughs> or I wish, um, it starts to then slow down. So it's a really important time to consider a collagen supplement like the Q Silica Pro Collagen. It's our connective tissue, it's our bone density, and even our, you know, I am vain at the end of the day, a little, a little bit. So our hair and our nails, um, it's going to really strengthen, keep your hair looking shiny. So collagen really is a plus. So if I had a choice, I would probably rather lean towards the, um, the plant-based products. A lot of people aren't aware that collagen itself is derived from animal sources. So if you are a vegan, if you are someone that you're mindful of this, it's obviously something that you don't want to do. So is there vegan collagen out there? And the answer is yes. So the Q Silica Pro Collagen Supplement contains a painted to natural wheat seed extract, which is known as ceramicides. Ceramicides moisturise the skin from within and colloidal silica and vitamin C, they help with the natural production of collagen. Although I'm not vegan as such, I've made small lifestyle changes from cutting out dairy to using products that are ethically sourced, that are um, kind to the environment, kind to animals, but above all kind to my body. Um, I'm not vegan or vegetarian, but I think that introducing those kinds of products is actually becoming more commonplace and it's something that I would definitely think about. I would say on a scale from one to 10, the importance of skincare is probably around eight. I'm not so much concerned about my hair. Um... <laughs> Something I didn't know, Joe, is that iron deficiency is one of the most common nutrient deficiencies and forms of malnutrition across the globe. Yeah, you often hear people say they're low in iron, they might be lacking in energy and tired all the time, but why is it so prevalent and how do you know if your lethargy is in fact an iron deficiency? Who knows? The doctor's car, of course. Hi and welcome to Medicine Past, Present and Future. My name's Dr Nick and I'm the past. And my name's Dr Isabel and I'm the future. And together, we're, we're the, the present. present. Now, I've got an absolute doozy for you today, oh, Dr Isabel. Oh, go on, Dr Nick. <laughs> Do you know what we mean by the term pagophagia? Pagophagia. Oh, Dr Nick, I have no idea. What is it, a compulsion to eat pangolins? <laughs> nice try. No, pagophagia actually refers to eating ice. 
which turns out to be a symptom of iron deficiency. Oh, that sets my teeth on edge, Dr Nick, but why would you eat ice if you're iron deficient? Because eating ice, we think, makes you feel more alert and it's soothing for cracked lips and iron deficiency can cause fatigue and sore lips, so maybe that's why. Yeah, and as well as the tiredness and brain fog, there are some other unusual symptoms of iron deficiency, such as hair loss or restless legs, and something called pica, which is a compulsion to eat strange things, such as dirt, paper, or even ice. And these days we know that iron deficiency is actually much more common than we used to realise. A new study showed that up to a third of otherwise really fit and healthy active women turned out to be iron deficient. So, Dr Isabel, two questions for you. One one is, what's iron for? Why do we need it? And the other is, why is iron deficiency more common in women? So iron is the small molecule in our blood that helps transport oxygen to our cells. In short, we need it for our organs to breathe. Oh, so it's without iron, we just get sort of worn out and tired. That's right, hence the symptoms of fatigue. Now, for women who have heavy periods or periods that last for a number of days, they can lose a lot of blood and a lot of iron. We know that roughly two billion people on the planet suffer from iron deficiency, and it's not exactly a new thing. So, Dr Nick, what did we used to do about it? Yes, well, long before people even knew about iron deficiency, they actually used to supplement with iron. So, back in Roman times, gladiators who'd been injured would scrape the rust off their bloodied swords into their dinner. Oh, that's so gross. Yes. Oh, would you like some rust with that? <laughs> but what they were actually doing was topping up their iron without realising. And in the 17th century, women who were pale and anaemic were treated with sweet wine that had been boiled with iron filings. Again, iron supplements without actually knowing why. Luckily, nowadays, we don't have to resort to bloodied sword blades to get our iron content. We can get it from our diet. And things like red meat are a really good source of iron. Now, green leafy vegetables are also rich in iron, but it's what we call less bioavailable, meaning it's actually quite hard for our bodies to catch on to it and absorb it. Yes, so much so that vegetarians need to eat the equivalent of three whole cups of cooked kale every day just to meet their iron needs. This is a lot of green smoothies. <laughs> Which is why this is one of the times when doctors often recommend a supplement or even a thing called an iron infusion. But Dr Isabel, we said that blood loss is a cause of iron deficiency. Now, unless you're taking up a career as a gladiator, what are the other reasons why people might be short of blood? I'm glad you asked that, Dr Nick, because iron deficiency and anemia is also associated with many diseases, one of which is bleeding from the bowels. Now, this can be due to a number of different reasons, and it can be benign, but it could also be more serious, like a tumour. So this is why we have what's called the Fecal Occult Blood Screening Program, where once you reach the age of 50, you're invited to send in some poo every couple of years. Now, we know that less than 50% of the Australian adult population is taking part in this test, and it's really important. <laughs> so if that test kit is sitting on the bathroom shelf, just get on and do it, because it might even save your life. Fancy a smoothie, Dr Nick? Uh, yes, yeah, as long as I can have the one with the peanut butter and the chocolate. Hold the kale. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> thank you, Dr Nick. And thank you, Dr Isabel. Welcome back. Before the break, doctors Isabella and Nick Carr looked at iron deficiency and ways we can get more iron in our diets. Now, Joe, oysters are a good source. I know you're not a necessarily big fan of oysters, <laughs> but are you back to enjoying steak these days? I I never stopped <laughs> eating steak. Well, I was never a vegan. Technically, you did. No, I said I wanted to be more plant-based. Mm. I have failed at that epically, I will admit, and well, I'm loving the steak. Thanks for your I interest. You had a 10-day window <laughs> there that was definitely vegan. And I was very proud of you at that stage. Well, Joe, before we go, there's been a recent appeal for wildlife researchers and it's got to do with the platypus. Oh, we love platypuses and they're asking us all to be mindful about our rubbish after finding many wild platypus injured by common household items. So things like those plastic rings that you pull off bottles and hair ties and ring seals from jars and elastic bands have been found around their necks, jaws and bodies, which is absolutely heartbreaking. Yeah, just cutting them before you throw them away will help and, of course, disposing of them in the right recycling bin too. Yes, and here's a tip. Only clean plastic is recyclable, so wash your plastics before you toss them in the bin. 
Well, that's it for today, Joe. Tune into Joe Stanley and GQ every Sunday for the House of Wellness radio show. And check out our website, houseofwellness.com.au, for more info on the show. And as always, thanks to our very good friends at Chemist Warehouse. We'll see you soon.